wonderful piece called The Mountains of Wicklow. I'd like to read two poems set in The Mountains of Wicklow. And these are both inspired by the mining heritage. Mullacore. Two miners lead two mules up a winding track, past the smelting house and Balan of Unchug at it. Hobnail boots and iron shod hoofs grind pine needles into granite. Halfway up they stop to drink from the stream that rings silver through gorse and frocken to Millbrook water wheel. The mules lengthen their stride of the pass, unflinching when wimbrel burst from cotton grass, calls rippling across the heath. At the edge of the cutting, the men bend and heave to fill the creels with footed peat. Above them, forked tail and finger-tipped wings, a lone red kite glides bronze as withered bracken. So the red kite that appears at the end of the poem uh, would have been in Wicklow 200 years ago. People now see it because it's been reintroduced in the last 15 years. But I like to think of the link between what we see now in our skies and what the miners would have seen back then. So the, the second poem about the mine coming from the mines uh, was evoked by a conversation with a miner who told me about how much he loved working with the pit ponies. Pit ponies of Glendasson, hitched to an eight hour shift in Britons, Hames and Traces, they follow the miners carbide lights, halt under hoppers, turn on a truppence and lean into their collars to pull the five wagon train. Low set cobs from the curra, a piebald and two greys, their hooves fall heavy as hammers on granite. They haul lengths of large for pit props, pneumatic drills, boxes of gelignite, and from time to time deliver injured men back to daylight. The miners pat their necks in passing and feed them windfall apples. Comrades in toil and first to stall, legs locked at a sudden rumbling, a change in the air or the rush of running water. from a year ago, almost to the day, 
uh, when a neighbour of ours had died. First areas. By rights we'd be standing side by side, making idle conversation as we wait to shake hands with our grieving neighbours after Requiem Mass in Green Anne. But we keep the by road between us today. The virus lingers, a low-lying cloud, until someone asks about planting first airlies. Advice flies from gateway to gateway. You can split seed potatoes as long as each half has a chit. Dig plenty of manure into the drill. Place them a foot apart, a fist deep. Don't forget to earth up the shoots. They'll be ready for lifting mid-June. Sharps Express, Satanta, Orla, Slaney, Red Cara Accord. Our litanies only hushed by the hearse coming down the road. And in that first lockdown uh, last year, many of us couldn't be with people who were ill and that distance was very difficult and continues to be. Um, at that time, my mother wasn't well and I was walking the hills in Wicklow and I imagined being able to send her the flowers from those hills. And I suppose what I had in mind also was the healing properties of many wildflowers flowers from the hills. Because I can't travel the distance between us, I'll send you flowers from the hills. Ladies' bed straw to light your bedroom, laid by your pillow, it'll scent your sleep. Scarlet pimpernel to scatter your sadness, it wakes early as the blackbird sings. Crane's bill, Herb Robert, Ragged Robin, will blush pink as dawn to your window. Eyebright will heal your tired sight. Two-lipped petals, lilac-lined. Teasel for the goldfinch in your garden. Orange tips will sip from the leaves. Marsh marigold to ward off all harm. Stitchwork sprinkled like stars at your feet.
after that uh, powerfully evocative piece, Port de Bucky, I'd like to read two poems from my second collection, When the Tree Falls. And um, the first was when my father was very ill in hospital and I couldn't be with him. And partly I chose to read that today because I know other people have had that experience more recently. That I could. That I could take away from him these long days in the hospital, the digging for a vein in his arm, the drip that stops him sleeping, the pain that makes him whisper, Jesus Christ, oh Jesus Christ, that I could take him back to his cobblestones and barn, his rooks and the birch trees, his nettles and ditches, limestone and bog, that I could find the words to tell him what he will always be, horse chestnut petals falling pink in the yard, the well hidden in a black thorn thicket, a summer evening's hush, cattle standing orange in the shallows. And the second poem is from later on when my father was at home. We were nursing him at home the last two months of his life. I've got you. Through days of morphine and tidbits to tempt his appetite, there's nowhere else to be. I hold his teacup to his lips, wash his face and the hands I rarely touched. During the night, old hurts and worries surface like stones in a well-tilled field. What time is it now, he asks, on the hour. He sings to himself and murmurs lines he learned as a child. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. When he asks to get up, I hold his wrists, brace my weight against his. For a moment, He's confused. It's okay, Jamie. I've got you. Go on now. You can stand.
So uh, some poems uh, take a lot of work over a long time and then some poems come to you like a gift and this is one of those. Back of an envelope. I don't know what's come over your father, my mother says on the phone. He left a note on the back of an envelope. Gone herding, won't be long. Where did he think I think he was gone? All those years, if I asked where he was going, where he had been, he'd act like I'd tethered him to a post. And today, he leaves a note. And uh, the second poem is uh, likewise a celebration of a long-lived love. The Yellow Jumper. They weren't married long when she saw it. A turtleneck jumper in Murray's window, yellow as happiness, as the flash on a goldfinch's wings. She imagined him wearing it at the fairs, standing out from all the rest in their greens and greys. Eighteen shillings and sixpence. She paid for it on tick, threepence a week. For all that he smiled on his birthday, it remained on the back of the bedroom chair. One day, she folded and packed it in the chest with the spare candles, letters, photographs, and the other questions she didn't ask. She likes to think of him there, among pens of breeding, heifers, weanlings, and hoggets splendid in yellow. started in the mountains with our music and poetry today and we're going back to the mountains for the last poem and I suppose one of the sentences I've probably heard more than any other over the last year is when all this is over and I suppose that you know, those words are filled with our longing of the things we'd like to do uh, when we can again. And this poem, actually, I wrote it as part of a sequence of poems about the First World War. And so I suppose those, those words, when all this is over, we use them to get us through any crisis. When all this is over, we'll follow a path through silver birch and pine. Listen for the shepherd whistling to her flock of pregnant ewes. Look for grasses herbs trampled under their hooves. Catch the scent of crushed chamomile, lavender, thyme. From the mossy mountainside, drink the river's source. <laughs> Thank you. 